Hi everybody, I'm Jack the Rambling Rank and I hope that you're doing well. I hope you've been having a great weekend. Uh, the library tour continues in this video as the Shelfie Safari heads to outer space. Uh, we're going to be hitting the mass market paperbacks that are usually on the shelf. Many of them, uh, but not all, are science fiction or sword and sorcery. But there are a few uh, fun interlopers. And there's also the, uh, the continuation of, I should say, a publishing sequel <laughs> to a very popular series from, I believe, the 70s or 80s that I don't see too many people talking about. But let's kick it off with the late, great Carl Edward Wagner, uh, an all-time favorite of mine, the creator of Cain, this red-bearded version of Conan the Barbarian uh, that is just very, very dark. Um, Wagner had written some Robert E. Howard like pastiche uh, books or stories where he continues characters like Conan or Bran McMorn, uh, but Cain is very much his own creation, and <laughs> it's just wild. Uh, this is Darkness Weaves, the first of the books, um, and this is the, a later publication that printed the full, like, unexpurgated version. Um, but we've got Darkness Weaves, we have Bloodstone, the first one I read, which is this wild one. This involves aliens. Um, then there is Dark Crusade and Night Winds. And so all of these involve Kane, who's just a wild romp of a character. And I first discovered Carl Edward Ragnar through the introduction to a um, Del Rey H.P. Lovecraft volume, I think of the Dreams volume. I want to say it's by Neil Gaiman, where he talks about being on a panel with Ramsey Campbell, Carl Edward Wagner, and I believe Dave Carson. And that was the first time I, time I came across the name, and I thought, oh, I've heard of Ramsey Campbell. I've read some of his you know, books or stories. Who are these others? And that kind of led me to Carl Edward Wagner, who also then did this strange collaboration with David Drake, whose books you can find much more frequently than Wagner's, called Killer. Uh, <laughs> he's a beast hunter who fed the bloody maw of Rome's Colosseum. He had trapped tigers in India, lions in the hills of Macedon, elephants where the Mediterranean surges against the foot of the Atlas Mountains. How is he to know that the beast he hunted this time came from a star whose light had not yet reached Earth? Uh, and so <laughs> this is an equal trip. As you see, we have gladiators with uh, laser blasters and a monster. Uh, but I'm a huge fan of, of Carl Edward Wagner. He, he's not only a great sword and sorcery writer, but a great horror writer. Uh, his short story, Styx, is sometimes found in anthologies. He uh, anthologized with uh, Michael Moorcock sometimes. So just a, a wonderful writer. Next up, Fritz Lieber, another great one. Uh, the first three of these are the uh, Fofford and the Grey Mouser books. So Swords and Deviltry. And these are really collections of short stories that show two characters, one of whom is sort of this enormous you know, Conan-type character uh, who is not super loquacious and much bigger, and then the Grey Mouser who's smaller and has like a thin rapier and is sort of, you know, a Dungeons & Dragons rogue. <laughs> but uh, Swords and Deviltry, which is amazing. Swords Against Death, there's a theme, they all, they're all called swords. Uh, swords in the Mist, there's also Swords Against Wizardry, um, but I also have a collection of his short stories, Knight's Black Agents, the classic fantasy of Fritz Lieber. And here you have, you know, Fafford and the Grey Mouser, and just great stories in this volume as well. This has The Sunken Land, uh, Adept's, Adept's Gambit, Man Who Never Grew Young, Smoke Ghost, The Automatic Pistol, The Inheritance, The Hill in the Hole, The Dreams of Albert Moreland, The Hound, Diary in the Snow, The Girl with the Hungry Eyes, and Bit of the Dark World. Most of these are from the 1940s. Uh, and so it's interesting to see somebody picking up that sword and sorcery mantle almost right away uh, from, you know, the, the weird tale stories in the 30s. So now, I said, you know, space. Shadow of the Moon, despite the title, is not a science fiction novel. This is by MMK. This is from the 1950s. And it was reprinted after the enormous success of MMK's The Far Pavilions, uh, set during the British Raj. And these are both very long, you know, uh, thoroughly delineated characters. Uh, this one has winter. Um, and this was the, fa I, I discovered this book because this was the favorite, uh, like, adolescent novel um, from one of my friends in college. She was, she's an ex-girlfriend of my, one of my closest friends from college. And she loved this book, and that kind of led me to discover MMK and ultimately the Far Pavilions. And so, uh, 
those are those are they're very 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 good books they um they, they really do explore the people of uh, of the raj not just the british you know colonists there but the many people who are, who are native to that land um and try to try to draw them as, as real people not just you know uh, uh sidebar characters so continuing the vein that this is not all science fiction we have tapping the source by kem nunn great surfer mystery thriller <laughs> this is the inspiration for the film point break um but it's totally different from the film surfer criminals is about the only thing the book and the film adaptation have in common uh this is a fascinating book if you're a fan of elmore leonard james crumley uh even daryl ponixon um th this is ross mcdonald these this is a writer to check out the book can be hard to find but it it's really fantastic. Um, it's one I absolutely love. People came to Huntington Beach in search of the endless party, the ultimate high, and the perfect wave. Ike Tucker came looking for his vanished sister and for the three men who might have murdered her. In that place of gilded surfers and sun-bleached blondes, Ike looked into the shadows. He found parties that drifted toward pointless violence and joyless violations, highs you might never come down from, a sea of old hatreds and dreams gone bad that was wilder, deeper, and deadlier than the Pacific. In the aftermath of Ian Fleming's death, uh, his estate wanted to continue the James Bond novels, and so they uh, tapped Kingsley Amos to write one, and he used a pseudonym, Robert Markham, and produced Colonel Sun. The titular character is the, the big bad of the book. Uh, and this t very much picks up the Ian Fleming Bond and doesn't turn it into... Uh, John Gardner um, very much seems like somebody who had seen the movies when he started writing his continuation books. Uh, Raymond Benson later on has seen the movies and also seen the idea that, that there's product placement. <laughs> uh, Amos tries to take it in his own direction. Bond's a little bit older, a little bit wiser, uh, certainly jaded, and this is a fascinating book. Again, Light Tapping the Source can be hard to find, but a great, great read. Uh, Fahrenheit 451 by Ray Bradbury, I'm a huge fan. 1984 by George Orwell. Chimera by John Barth. I love this book. Uh, it, it essentially takes three tales. One is the uh, <laughs> the Duniazad, so the sister of Scheherazade. Another is the Perseid, so Perseus going up against Medusa. And then finally the uh, story of Bellerophon and the Chimera. And it, uh, it really goes in and probes the ideas of those old Greek myths, uh, the, you know, the fairy tales of the Arabian Nights. And, and pokes at them and prods them in really interesting ways and ties them together in really fascinating ways, ways that I love. Uh, so I'm, I'm a huge fan of that. Uh, the Day of the Jackal by Frederick Forsyth, about a plot to assassinate Charles de Gaulle. And the, 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 the um, original adaptation with was Edward Fox and Michael Lonsdale is fantastic, um, Delphine Syrig, but the book is an excellent thriller, one that I highly, highly recommend. Now back to science fiction. And a favorite of mine, uh, we saw him a couple weeks ago, Roger Zelazny. We've got the Lord of Light here. So one of the things Zelazny loved to do was to take um, religious texts or religious traditions and then try to write a science fiction novel around them or a story. So in A Rose for Ecclesiastes, uh, he's using Ecclesiastes. <laughs> um, but in this one, uh, he, we have his followers called him Mahasamatman, and said he was a god. He preferred to drop the Maha and Atman, however, and called himself Sam. He never claimed to be a god, but then he never claimed not to be. Uh, and this is, this is a great book. I think this is one of Zelazny's most well-known sort of standalone science fiction books. But I also love his short stories. So, The Doors of His Face, The Lamps of His Mouth, that titular story is set on old Venus. Um, this Venus of, like, you know, essentially continent size rainforests enormous oceans a sort of moby dick type whale down there that they're going to try and catch uh, but this one also has a rose for ecclesiastes um it also includes this has a lot of keys to december a devil car monster in the maiden collector's fever this mortal mountain this moment of the storm the great slow kings a museum piece divine madness corrida love is an imaginary number the man who loved the faoli and lucifer uh, this is a very good volume it's when I often take on trips and will like read a short story a night like in the hotel room or something. <laughs> uh, and then the last Defender 
of Camelot contains five Nebula and Hugo nominees. Last Defender of Camelot's great, where we have this like <laughs> Merlin and Lancelot, and they're they're gonna like you know re regain control. Um, and then Lancelot it sort of realizes like, wait a second, like things have improved from the feudal era. This might not be so bad. Uh, and it's it's very good. But this is again a great collection of Zlatan's stories, and I, I'm just a huge fan of him. Then we have a uh, dual pair from Alan Dean Foster. My first Alan Dean Foster novel was definitely uh, Splinter of the Mind's Eye. The sort of, it would have been the Star Wars film if Star Wars had been a bad movie that didn't do well. Uh, and it was just going to be a cheapo with just Luke, Leia, and Darth Vader on this crummy little uh, planet. And so he, he had written that, but he has with friends like these, who needs enemies? Um, and, the silly covers are, 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 are quite wonderful, but the stories inside, some of them are really quite dark. Foster has the ability to have some whimsy. <laughs> and to, you know, it's not all dark and brutal and nihilistic like Carl Edward Wagner. Uh, but like Zelazny, he has a sense of humor, um, but he also has a sense of, of, of darkness up to him. And we have The Female Man by Joanna Russ, one of my favorite science fiction writers who I almost never hear anybody talk about. I think. Uh, Picnic of Paradise, or uh, Picnic on Paradise, was in the more recent um, Library of America's 1960s science fiction collection. Uh, so hopefully her name's getting out more. But she wrote a lot of great science fiction short stories, and she really, really had some great science fiction books. The Female Man is probably her best book, um, and it's one I I love. I love the the questions she's exploring. Um, she she's exploring some of the same questions that I think Ursula K. Le Guin was probing in The Left Hand of Darkness, uh, but she's doing it from such a different point of view um, and such a different sense of, of humanity um, with it within, uh, within Russ's mind. that it's, it's fantastic, it's fascinating, it's a book that I, uh, I, I return to as I return to her stories. Hot House from Brian Aldiss. Uh, this is a Hugo winner. This is a great, like, you know, uh, last days of man under a dying sun, monstrous sentient plants and carnivorous insects are the predators. Man is the prey. And so the idea that with uh, climate change, you know, plants and animals have become enormous. It's sort of an old Venus type book, except set on a future Earth. And uh, this is a good one. And then it, we move forward into cyberpunk with William Gibson's Neuromancer. Uh, sometimes I want to call it New Romancer. <laughs> and uh, this is a very, very good book. I, I know some people, I don't like all of Gibson's books. Um, and I know some people feel that this book is overrated or unfulfilled. Uh, I think it's excellent. I think that it's, it's a great example of cyberpunk, but I also think it really, really is just a fascinating, exploration of future possibilities, speculative fiction, uh, the best that science fiction can offer. And I enjoy this book quite a bit. All right, now moving over, we do have some more sort of sci-fi adjacent. So Brian Lumley's Necroscope, uh, which posits the existence of a, <laughs> a sort of secret um, governmental agency that's going to hunt down the vampires and werewolves and such, uh, primarily vampires. And in the Balkan Mountains of Romania, terrible evil is growing. Long buried in hallowed ground, bound by earth and silver, the master's vampire schemes and plots. Trapped in unlife, neither dead nor dying, Tibor Ferenczi hungers for freedom and revenge. <laughs> uh, to protect Harry, the dead will do anything even rise from their graves. And this kicks off uh, the great Necroscope series from Brian Lumley. Uh, Vampiri comes next, and I, I enjoy Lumley. It's, he's got the, the, the cosmic sense of horror, the, the Victorian horror, but then he couples it with very, um, characters who, protagonists who are very much willing to take action, not just like sit and let it happen and look around, but, but pursue uh, a, a route. Uh, the Beetle from Richard Marsh, and this is in the weird Penguin Yellow Book uh, series, Yellow Spine series, which I believe is, was, I think it was primarily sold in the UK, um, but the, the Yellow Spines are like horror books, um, and this is one. This is a Victorian era horror book, so The Beetle arrives from Egypt. 
a creature of horror that can change its shape at will and compel others to do its bidding. Bent on revenge for a crime committed against the disciples of Isis, the beetle terrorizes its victims and will stop at nothing until it is satisfied. Clive Barker's Cold Heart Canyon. Uh, Clive Barker has some great short stories. Some of his books I, I, I to was totally disinterested in. This one I find fascinating because of the way that it looks at silent film Hollywood and sort of old 1920s, 1930s Hollywood and then couples that with this like 1990s action star um, who's recovering at the estate and turns out that it's haunted and all sorts of horrors ensue. But that's why I enjoy this book is because of the way it looks at those old silent films. Neil Stevenson's Cryptonomicon, sort of early cyberpunk almost. Um, and uh, I, I enjoy Stevenson. I know there, there are people, his books can be very long and filled with these characters or details that are almost parodies of Charles Dickens, perhaps unintentionally, uh, but I think the books are interesting. And then The Great A Fire Upon the Deep by Werner Vinge. The only one of Vinge's novels I think that I've read. I love uh, his ex-wife, Joan D. Vinge's Snow Queen series, but I believe this is the only Werner Vinge book I've read, so I don't know if, I, I enjoy it quite a bit. I don't know if others have read it uh, and, and would recommend other works from him. Couple more. Around the World in 80 Days by Jules Verne. I've had this copy since I was a kid. I, I love this book. Um, and is that, I think that's my favorite from Verne. I really like Journey to the Center of the Earth, but I think I, I slightly edge Around the World in 80 Days. It, it probably just depends on which one I've read most recently. And then Alice's Adventures in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass by Lewis Carroll. Again, this has been a copy I've had since I was a child. And this is a, this is a book that I... It's interesting to reread. There's, there's, there's so much humor in it that is subtle and that I didn't, you know, I, I picked up maybe the, some of it the first time. I was always horrified by uh, uh, the poem around the walrus. <laughs> and the adaptation <laughs> scared the daylights out of me. Um, but it's a book I reread probably about every 10 years or so. So now, that weird series I told you about. So I don't know if people remember the Wagons West series. I believe the author was Dana Fuller Ross in uh, certainly the 1980s, maybe the 1970s as well, but it was like Independence, Nebraska, always with an exclamation point, Oregon, Arizona. And it had this whole like saga of all of these different characters and these same couple families. Well, the same crew pushed out the Children of the Lion, which uses as its frame narrative, primarily Genesis and Exodus, um, and really primarily Genesis, but characters interacting with character, you know, with personages from the book of Genesis and then later on the book of Exodus. Uh, and so uh, Hagar, uh, Abraham, Abraham's concubine, is in this book. Um, as are other, you know, the, we, we get to see ancient Babylon. We see uh, sort of the journey of Abram uh, and, and Sarai over into the promised land. Uh, not many of the books are, I would say, extremely like well-written and well-characterized. But the first one, Children of the Lion, is, is pretty interesting. I think the best one is The Shepherd Kings, which is the second book and deals with um, Jacob, the son of Isaac, as sort of this shepherd king. And I think that's just like an interesting concept. Um, it also has uh, Rachel. But hey, Dad, a young artisan, poor, broken in body, but mighty in spirit, together... Hey, Dad and Jacob, they forged a legendary friendship that shaped history. And from the women they loved, they gathered strength. Um, but The Shepherd Kings is, is probably the best of, of the Children of the Lion books. There's also oh, Vengeance of the Lion, and then Lion in Egypt is the fourth one. It continues through uh, to the Exodus. The Sea Peoples is one of the titles. Um, and th as the series goes on, a certainly after the second book, as with Wagons West, there's... There's some that there's uh, there's some en an energy to it, uh, <laughs> there's many where it's part of a series, and that's that's how we'll say it. The last of these would be uh, the story of O by Pauline uh, Rayage. Uh, this is a purchase from my wife, uh, but it is a book that explores uh, human sexuality and human relationships uh, in very frank detail and. Um, so this is one uh, that's on that same shelf as well. Juxtaposes so well with the Children of the Lion. 
Uh, but um, yeah, let me know if you've read any of these. Uh, recommendations, certainly for Werner Vinge, but for any of the others as well. Uh, and I hope everybody's having a great week. We'll see where we are next week. Thanks.